this year for Christmas, all I want is a microphone so that I can start practicing my own podcast. It's going to be called To the Dough. But I can only do that if Aaron and Danae stop their podcast. So this is what you call a conundrum. Because I want to do a podcast like To the Dough because it's so fun. But I don't want them to stop. I think they also call this a dilemma. Right. Well, of the two that that won the vote this year, I preferred Downton Abbey. I thought Downton Abbey was spectacular. Now, I've never seen that, but my wife is obsessed, and she loves it. So It's so good. You have a wife? (laughs) I do, yes. Surprise! (laughs) I learn something new about you all the time. It's really, really good. All right. My wife hear you say that. She'll make me watch it. (laughs) You don't have much to catch up on if you want to, because it's only been a couple seasons, and there's only like seven episodes per season. So I'm eternally fascinated by that, how different the British concept of a, a series uh, or a season is from ours. It's crazy. Yeah, and they do. They call them series. Yeah. Wouldn't and that be called C-Rye? Series. C-Rye, C- C- yes. No, <laughs> it's that's a series Siri. of C-Rye. Siri? What are C-Rye? Well, you ready to shoot a dough? Sure. You, you know I have no context for what that, what that means, right? <laughs> Would you like some context? Well, my, in my head, I imagine one of you was trying to say, do the show, and said it wrong, and it became an inside joke that became the title of your podcast, but I don't know if that's close. That's really close. It, See, there's only one thing that's not quite right that's about right. that. That's right. There's one. Which is the fact. That he did it on purpose. That it wasn't an accident. <laughs> yes. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a spoonerism. You know, just switch, you know, the first letters or whatever. And so, yeah, I took, it was like, what, your second or third morning you yeah, came in? Yeah, right at the very beginning of my fledgling radio career. And I said, hey, you ready to shoe the dough? And she was like, what are you talking about? <laughs> my unexpected. Were you on the air? No, 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 no. Very close, my friend. Very close. Well, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty much a genius. <laughs> you pretty much are. That's why we love having you on to talk about movies. There's no better use of genius than to break down pop culture, especially when, especially when you're talking about Spider-Man Four. Oops, I mean the Amazing Spider-Man. Yes. <laughs> so this is, of course, continues to follow Peter Parker. I, I, I as never Spider-Man. said I was ready to shoot the dough. Oh, I'm sorry, Danae. Are you also ready to shoot the dough? Yes, I am. Okay, good. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Peter Parker is back, and Spider-Man's back, and all the characters you know and love. In fact, this is a reboot, quote-unquote, which means throw those old ones out the window. We want permission to reset the story and and do what we're going to do. And it's really kind of the first time that it's been this quick. Am I wrong about that? Has there ever been a reboot within, like, a decade? No. There can't be anything did, this fast, I don't think. Do the Batmans count? Did those come out pretty quickly? Like, Because Batman, there's been a lot of Batman versions. Well, the first one was, what, 89? Somewhere around there. So, And then the Christopher Nolan one started in 2006, somewhere mm. around there? So that's a pretty good length no, of time. No, Batman Begins was, yeah, 2005. Okay. So so how many years between these Spider-Mans? Well, the first one was, was 2001. The last one, I think, was 2007. Yep, I think you're right. So it's still five years. I mean, is that really too soon? Uh, yes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, absolutely too soon. <laughs> Uh, and we'll yes, get, it's too soon. We'll get more into that as well, but this is another origin story. I mean, it pretty it is the origin story of Spider-Man, which we saw with Tobey Maguire uh, in uh, the early 2000s, and now we're seeing it with Andrew Garfield. Emma Stone is in it as well, uh, directed by Mark Webb, uh, whose only credit that I'm aware of is 500 Days of Summer, which is, which a mo- is excellent. Which is a great movie. Never saw it. Um, I think they. All, I think it's also um, has, must his last name. You know, they figured Mark Webb had to do a Spider-Man movie. That's how Hollywood has... That's, that's how it works. Started choosing directors. Yes, it's it's all about who you know and what your last name is. <laughs> um, so, yeah, so what do we think? Jeremy, why, uh, why don't, actually, we're going to let Danae start us off this time. Danae, what do you think about The Amazing Spider-Man? The Amazing Spider-Man put me into a unique position. Yeah. Quite, quite literally in my seat, because I found that by the end of the movie... I had to change positions so that my body wouldn't go numb <laughs> quite a bit. Like, I think I... Are you saying it's too long? I think I found, like, eight different seating seated positions during uh-huh. this movie. So that's that was my quite literal. And then I was also... I found myself uh, moving into an area in my brain that has never happened in a film before. Ooh, interesting. I became an editor. <laughs> okay. So I found that by the second half of the movie... I was experiencing each 
new scene and wondering if it could have just been dropped. Like, did we really need to go back to this or whatever? So it was really strange for me. It was, I didn't expect that I was going to be doing that. So what I'm gathering from what you're saying is you felt it it was a little long, that it dragged. And so instead of your brain enjoying the movie, your brain's thinking about, did I really need to see this? I'm kind of ready for this to be to move on, that kind of thing. But at the same time, I really was enjoying some of the character development because I actually kind of liked the very the first half of the movie in that way. Because I was like, wow, you know, this is getting you know, really emotional, tying into the families and I was buying into all of that. I was enjoying this kind of more deeper thing. And then I realized, oh, the first half of the movie is these character relationship building. And now we're going into the action part. So overall, positive, negative? What Over, you- overall, was it was a positive experience for me. What about you, Jeremy? I thought it was great. I was really surprised. I, I've been nothing but sarcastic about this movie for six months, <laughs> uh, about how unnecessary it is, even, even knowing... You know, I guess apparently they they had to make another Spider-Man movie or lose the rights or something like that. Right. And so even though there's a decent financial business decision for it, it's just unnecessary is the word I have always used to describe this movie. It's completely unnecessary. And I loved it. I don't know if that let my guard down so that I was expecting nothing. I thought Andrew Garfield was outstanding and really engaging. It didn't it didn't feel long to me. Uh, almost end up ended up feeling like it could have been longer. I, I just thought it was a really solid all the characters are good the action was good i really liked it well i get to be the spoiler then um and i don't mean that in a movie sense i uh, what you say is true a andrew garfield is amazing in this movie i loved him in this movie i thought he was great i love his presence i love how he delivers lines uh i felt like he really was peter parker in in spider-man uh i love kind of that quirky way he played spider-man like it was like you knew it was andrew andrew garfield under the suit by the way he was you know moving and right and uh and i really love that emma stone has always been one of my favorites i think she's great in this as well the action is fun and visually engaging and and great but it is not a great movie and here's the reason i say that you talk about it being unnecessary and what i had heard about this reboot was that it was going to be an opportunity to adjust the feel of Spider-Man so that it was more realistic. Not necessarily Nolan's Batman realistic, but more like, you know, we've seen with Iron Man or the Avengers or, you know, just kind of existed more in a real world. And I felt like this movie was exactly the same as the first three. Like, I felt Mm. like the tone was the same. I felt like it had that jokey, jokey kind of thing going on, that there were the same kind of really weird moments that are just begging to be made fun of. Like, um, do you know what riff tracks are? Yeah. That's where these guys who used to do Mystery Science Theater, uh, you know, make fun of modern movies. And I felt like this was a movie just begging to be riff tracks. Uh, the moment where he's in the Lizard's underground lair, and for whatever reason... Kurt Connors, or the lizard, decided to leave this great PowerPoint presentation of how he was going to <laughs> take over the city. And it's like, all he has to do is hit play, and it's like, it's got graphics, and uh-huh. it's got little lizards that take <laughs> yeah. over the city. It's like, yep. when did he decide to do this, and why? Why is he making this PowerPoint about how I'm going to do this? That You know what I mean? Just stuff like that. The duplicating lizards. Yeah, the duplicating lizards that kind of crawled across the screen. And yeah. then the other point was at the end. Uh, towards the end where the crane operator's like, okay, guys, let's line up the cranes. And there just happened to be cranes, All these cranes lined up across the city and the ability to communicate with these people in that way. And I understand that's kind of the part of your brain you're supposed to shut off when you watch these movies. But that was always, to me, kind of the flack with the, the first ones. And I was hoping that it would be a little different with this one. I can I can completely connect with you on on that. Several times through the movie, I actually was thinking, hmm, this is like what Jeremy was talking about whenever things just happen very conveniently for the, (laughs) you know, it's like, oh, conveniently, uh, you know, is it Gwen? Yeah, Gwen Stacy. She works for this company and so she can get in and she can do these (laughs) things. And oh, conveniently, you know, so it's like all these things started happening. And what was frustrating for me is that by the time all these convenient plot things start to happen, it's towards the end of the movie when they're trying to move it along and kind of get towards the end. I guess there's a part of it, and maybe you can speak a little bit to this, Jeremy. Do you feel like the summer big-budget action movie kind of game has changed 
since the Marvel movies have started, you know, with the with Iron Man and most recently the Avengers. Like it used to be this thing where you could kind of just throw big action scenes on the screen and people would flock to it and love it. But now the audience is, you know, more wants something a little more defined. I mean, it's definitely changed, and I think it's always changing. I think it started changing with with Batman Begins. I think Nolan was the one who kind of first made everyone think, okay, so we, we can approach these stories in a, in a more grounded way, right? Uh, but still have some fantastic elements in them. It's it's interesting though because even though the Marvel movies have that, like you said, somewhat grounded more in reality than the superhero films of old, I still think they're completely different films than the kind of movies that Nolan is making. Like Nolan's trying to make a drama. Uh, it's serious. It's heavy. It's weighted. And the Marvel movies are trying to be a light breeze of fun and uh, I think they they both work on different levels. You know, I watch a movie like this, and it just reminded me of the you know the nine late nineties, you know maybe even early two thousands, cheese ball summer, Independence Day, uh, Twister. You know, just it just it kind of felt like that to me instead of kind of the more modern. Even if it's stylized, it it feels like it exists in a real you know universe. I think it's I think it's really interesting how we can. You and I are pretty similar guys, and, and over the years we, we have pretty similar tastes, but you know how we can both kind of see different things in the same movie. I, 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 not even different things. Like, okay, when the little tiny lizards are all <laughs> crawling up the web, showing Peter the direction to go to find the big lizard, right. that's ridiculous. Uh-huh. Right? Like, it like, takes where do me these out lizards the come from? Uh, but I also feel like there are very few movies that, that don't have those moments, and I think – what happened in this instance was Andrew Garfield and then especially the chemistry he had with Emma Stone grabbed me right away. And and I think the reason I walk away really high on the movie is that what Webb did and what he was sort of expected to do was bring that new understanding of relationships that he displayed in 500 Days of Summer to a superhero film. I think that's what I really liked the most about it. All the moments between the two of them felt very authentic. Everything about Garfield's Peter Parker – felt authentic whereas even though i really love toby mcguire and even in the spider-man movies there's always that bit of putting on his phony right. naive kind of oh shucks it, it just felt very natural for me and i think i once i bought him and then that relationship or attraction with with gwen i think it was a lot easier for me to overlook the silly things like the tiny lizards or the powerpoint or definitely the cranes conveniently on tv are the spider-man movies right now and so i actually ended up watching spider-man 2 and 3 over the weekend and i much prefer this one to the other ones and i was i was hook line and sinker for this guy right from the very start i love his gigantic eyes and he can emote really well through them and you can kind of connect to his hurt and his pain and he did a great job in connecting relationally to all the people around him it's just that as those relationships continue to build and build and build and drive and drive and drive, the finale of the film isn't a relationship finale. It's an action sequence that left me like totally bored. Which is so funny because the action is one of my favorite things about this movie. And the, I love the way... I love the way Spider-Man moves when he's web-slinging in Well, there's a movie. difference between action <clears throat> and... An action plot. And the plot, right. Yeah. right. No, that's true. So yeah, I'll point. clarify that. I loved the way that they used the, you know, CG. It was just seamless. It looked great. It felt great. But the plot, I was, I was like, really? You've got these great relationship plots and this, these characters that are connecting really. You've got Sally Field, who's one of my faves. Come on, that's really. Oh, I, I we'll get to that in a minute. I'm okay. I'm ready. Good. I'm before, ready to get my guns and okay, just shoot this thing. Before we get up. to, before we get pew, to pew. best thing, worst thing. One other question for you guys, knowing that there are two now universes of Spider-Man, two origin stories have been told now, the first one with Tobey Maguire and now this one with with Andrew Garfield. Was it weird at all to you to see some of these same scenes in two different movies? Like I'm thinking specifically of Uncle Ben and of of the death. Mm -hmm. That was just weird to me. Like it totally took me out of the movie. I was like, wait, wait, I've seen this movie. See that that happened for me when he got bit by a spider. There was there are there are a lot of beats in this movie that feel familiar simply because they are right. And if you if you know, I kind of sort of told myself if I, if I'm not going to be able to get over that, I'm I'm not going to be able to get over anything in this movie because they're basically telling me ignore that other one. And so 
there's a moment with the spider. There's a moment, a couple of moments with Uncle Ben. Uh, you know, when he's on the bridge in the middle of action. There's several beats in the movie. The school that, fight. Yeah, yeah, uh, that feel similar. Uh, but if, if you if you sort of swallow that you can't avoid that, then you know I really liked the stuff that was new. Like, I guess we'll get into this in best and worst. I don't necessarily want to tip my hand, but okay, <laughs> uh, it did it did sort of unsettle me to see those beats again. But I don't know how you tell the story without doing it that way. One other question: Where was J. Jonah Jameson? Where's the yeah? Where's I the thought news- the same thing. Where's the newspaper? Although maybe they just thought, how are you going to beat the guy from the first movies? Oh. Like, why even try to recast that role? That's that, they actually probably made a wise decision, I imagine. I mean, you can't you're, it, unless you just cast him again. <laughs> uh, there's no way you're ever going to top that. Or that's coming up in the next one. Could be. Maybe we'll get some newspaper stuff. In because the next if they would have added one more relationship to build in this movie, <laughs> I read an I'm article glad yesterday that hinted that they want to do what what sort of they did with the Avengers. Sony wants to imitate that, only with villains. Yeah, like, I read that. Put out, uh, you know, maybe up to six Spider-Man villain movies, standalone Spider-Man movies, and then do one movie with a uh, six combined villains going against Spider-Man. Um, you know, it's just kind of an interesting wrinkle on that strategy. But yeah, there's no, there's no telling what they, what they want to bring in the next time. Yeah, for sure. All right, well, let's do best thing, worst thing. We'll, we'll start uh, with worst thing so we can end on an encouraging note for Spider-Man. And, uh, boy, I'm trying to decide who's itching more to talk. I think Danae is. What was your worst thing, Danae? Uh, I have six things written down. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you liked this movie. I did. I did like this movie. But here again, I'm okay with leaving a movie and going, overall, that was a good movie. So, yeah, and I think that clarifies my position as well before you get into this. It's like there's a there's a lot of fun to be had in this movie, but once I started seeing the cracks, it was like over for me. Like it was it was riff tracks. It was like, you know, then I just started seeing them all over the place. But I think there's a lot of fun to be had in the movie. But go ahead. Your worst thing. Well, I have six of them, so I don't know. I'm really curious what I'm going to do here. Well, I want to hear all six. Do you? I really do. Okay. All right. Well, there are certain things that happen during a movie that bug me, and I, I write them off. You know, no movie can be perfect except for Lord of the Rings. So, <laughs> um, and even there, and that's they had, why we're really good they, friends. They had to change a little bit of the plot line of Lord of the Rings. I get that, and by little I mean a lot. But Gwen's dad is is talking to the beloved Spidey out of costume in his office, and you know, Spidey's like, you know, you should go do this because I've I know the answer. And it's it's that thing that happens when the main person is talking, they're facing away from the camera, and their mouth is moving, and it doesn't match up with what you're hearing. That bugs the crud out of so me. So continuity stuff. That stuff. Then you've got, like, a big lizard man who, you know, hunts down Spidey, and then he disappears um, and happens to leave his lab coat. But in the very next scene, he's wearing his torn lab coat. Did he go wow, back and get it? you're a continuity it? Nazi. I never knew that about you. Oh, if, if you've got like a cigarette that's full, then it's half, and it's full, like in Face Off, I can't handle Face Off <laughs> because of that one scene. So <laughs> so you got those things happening, which really bothers that's me. That's the reason you can't handle Face Off? <laughs> well, <laughs> that's one of the main reasons. <laughs> All right. You have an entire platoon of police officers that are chasing through the city, and only one guy goes up to you know help Spider-Man. So now you've got this commissioner who you know is about to just die, and he's shooting his hand? Really? Shoot his head. Shoot the <laughs> lizard's face. Because I guess I still want to save the guy. I don't know. That really bothered me, too, because okay. you've got this whole team of people. So then I'm just like, I'm, I've am i got my guns out at this point of the movie, and I'm just shooting it down. I'm like, this is just leaves too much, too much, too much. And the other things that bothered me are all continuity and stuff, too. But those so are I my main So I think overall, ones. worst thing for you, then, would be continuity. I think you you really struggled with that they didn't get those specific things. That bothered me. Oh, and this is the this is probably the biggest one. It's gathering dust is what I call this one, where you're touring the facility and you walk in and it's like, oh, what's that machine that is in this pristine room um, <laughs> that still has steam coming out of it um, because it's still functioning? Oh, that's just this machine that never worked. It's just a protocol thing. It's just gathering dust. No, it's not. It's right there. There is no dust there. It is still functional. Like that. <laughs> then they just, oh, it magically comes back later on. And I'm just like, oh, Jeremy, please rip this one apart. Because if you don't, I will. <laughs> oh, I feel so much better. I've been holding on to this for like five days. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it was like a much needed bowel movement. Awesome. Woo. 
I can stretch, move. Huh. I'm free. I'm free. <laughs> what about you, Jeremy? What's your worst thing? Oh, uh, I walked out enjoying it. I don't have any of that kind of list. I don't have a list of six continuity glitches. I uh, <laughs> I hated the tiny lizards following around the big lizard. I know I've already mentioned that. <laughs> yeah. But why does why does it, why does his powers make him the Pied Piper? I don't understand why there's this unnatural call for all lizards in the vicinity to start flocking to him, like and the pheromone or something. That was silly. It seemed too convenient, especially when Spider-Man spent all that time setting up the thing so he could feel the vibrations, and then that goes nowhere, and then just so he can follow the little lizards. I thought I thought that was a little ridiculous. Um, yeah, and and you mentioned it. He also had the camera set up so he could take a picture, and that like had no purpose in the plot. Like, yep. you know, and well, and, except that the lizard get to find out his name by looking at the camera, right? But. Oh, that's again, right. That's right. Yeah, but that's but that's not a real life purpose. That's a plot purpose. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> By the time any of that continuity or or senseless plot devices cropped up, I think I was having so much fun with Andrew Garfield that it, it didn't really stand out. But uh, my worst thing is probably overall just the um, the cheese factor and just the convenient things. But I, I would also like to mention, since I haven't mentioned it, I'll mention it as my worst thing, even though technically probably not the worst thing. I really wasn't sold on the lizards CG, like on mm. that creature. Yeah. That creature mm. felt a little off to me. And I don't know if it was too shiny, if it was, there was just something about this, the movement and scope of it that just felt more CG than anything else in the movie. And so it, that took me out of it a couple times. And I did want to mention that. Uh, good thing, best thing. Jeremy, why don't you kick us off? What's your favorite thing? Well, you know, now I have a list of six things on the <laughs> best things. You can uh, I don't want to we'll steal anybody's thunder. Out. I'll just name a few. I thought I think nobody should ever play Uncle Ben but Martin Sheen again. I just right? love Martin Sheen. Okay, you already stole mine, but that's okay. That was a good one. <laughs> yeah, he was, he was, I thought he was oh, fantastic. Oh, he was so great. Good. He was so good as Uncle Ben. I, I've already mentioned how good Emma Stone and Andrew Garfield are. That's the mm-hmm. main reason I loved the movie. But since I've already mentioned that, I do want to talk about the alarm clock scene okay Um, oh my goodness and uh and then the stan lee cameo was the best they've ever done and they should stop doing them um because it was perfect even if it hadn't been him it would have been a great little scene Uh, but the fact that that's how they worked his cameo and i thought was brilliant today again besides the relationship building i thought it was really well done Mm -hmm. i really believed their relationships um so aside from that i would say that i really loved um, the first person perspective slash action or the movement scenes of Spider-Man through the city. They incorporated a lot of like, uh, was it parkour, mm-hmm. you know, and um, where in the first Spider-Man's, I remember being like, where is he shooting off his spider web to? It's like he was like launching them into clouds. clouds. Yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and and while watching it this weekend, I was confirmed on that. There's just like they're just out in you know nowhere like the 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 filming of that part it's just like they were just sweeping over a city out of frame out of mind yeah it was yeah. had that feel to it where this did not have that same feel this felt like you were in the city he was really moving through it and i, I actually really enjoyed that ride because there's a couple of times in the film where you go ahead and take a take a first person perspective ride with spidey and i thought that was cool my best thing was Martin Sheen, um, but I also <laughs> haven't mentioned uh, something else that I really love. Well, I kind of mentioned it, but that is not just the the action, but specifically the way Spider Man fought. Like his fighting style felt really good to me in this movie. The way yeah. he would use his web not only to attach to things, but also to propel himself. Sometimes uh, he would also, you know, he had just some of those classic poses. I also felt like a, a lot of times they really used the 3D well in mm-hmm. in those fighting scenes to give you a, a sense of perspective and a sense of, you know, distance and, in, in, you know, how he had to go from one place to another. So uh, we hadn't mentioned the 3D at all. Did either of you see it in 3D? I saw it in I, 3D. I did not. Um, I thought this this one maybe we're seeing in 3D. And I've heard actually maybe we're seeing in IMAX because I think they shot that last action scene in IMAX. Um, so, uh, I really, really enjoyed the look of Spider-Man while he was fighting in this movie, even, you know, down to kind of the, it was almost like a gunslinging 
you know, yeah. web shooting that he did a couple times with, you know, getting it over people's mouths or, you know, mm-hmm. locking their hands against walls and stuff. Yeah. And just the way he would yeah. flick it. And, you know, I really cool. have to give props to the movie, too, because after seeing this one, I something that was different from the first movie is the, the mechanism, the mechanical shooters. Which, yeah. which I was like, I'm confused because I it wasn't a comic book reader of Spider-Man specifically, so I didn't understand what the the shift was. So mm-hmm. I actually went and researched it. So I like it when a movie will take me beyond the film too, and I'm like, oh, I'm not ready to leave this world yet. So I actually went and did research on it, and where the first films took the approach of him having an organic web shoot, this was more. Uh, actual to the comic where he actually starts off not having webs he Mm -hmm. wanted them himself so this is this was closer to the actual origin of spider-man was that spider room not one of the creepiest environments you could imagine ever being in like why are you gonna understand why a person walks in no why would you or why you design it that way I mean, he was so curious about his (laughs) like death room well it's because that room they were making those strong steel they were right. They working was from the on web. the they steel were webbing, on the, the the web or whatever. Still the web or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> Still a room full of spiders. We've had this question every movie we've discussed, but did everybody stay for the scene in the credits? I did. I did. I did as well. Did anybody it, understand it? No, I had no. no I had no clue what it was about. Well, they never answered the the story or the the whole build up before the film was released and during the film. Of who is his dad? You know what? That if anything, is? that reminded me that the answer was never given the entire film, and it added just another thing on my list of going. Ah, I think what I think what we're discovering, and maybe we'll end it here, is that you kind of whatever psychological mindset you get yourself into this movie, you you you'll be able to carry it through. You know, if yeah. if you're willing to forgive it, it's summer movie flaws. And enjoy the acting and the relationships. You're gonna have a great time. If those cracks start to develop in your psyche, where you start to pick things apart, you're gonna continue to find them because they're all over this movie. At least if you know going into it what kind of movie it is, you know you can just kind of turn that part of your brain off, hopefully, and and just have a good time because it is a good time. It is a good movie. Yeah, it it it's de- and an if for no other reason than to see Andrew Garfield, Emma Stone, and Martin Sheen. They're great because they are they are absolutely phenomenal. And yeah, Sally Field, fantastic. And Emma's so fun to watch. They and were so fun to watch together. Really, honestly, Andrew Garfield's hair should have got a credit. I mean, <laughs> that was incredible. Really? Yeah. His hair? His hair. It was like it was like this like this physics defying gravitational force. It was incredible. He's incre- so good. He's so good in this movie. Like he nails that. There's only there's so many complex emotions that character would be feeling, and he hits them all. He does, he does. There's only one scene where I was like, eh, I was a little uncomfortable, and that's whenever, whenever he comes back after getting into the lizard fight, and he's got the scratch across his chest. And he kind of sneaks through the window, and they're having this conversation. But anyways, well, he kind of does this weird sort of casual, crazy, like let's get out of here <laughs> thing, and I'm like, ooh, that was weird. But I bet, I bet you his hair didn't move. <laughs> <laughs> How about some thank yous, Danae? How about them? Thank you to everyone who made this possible. My mom, my dad. I'm playing your thank you music. You know, like how... Oh, you know, is that my get, thank you music? Yeah, where you're, you're already getting cut off. Oh, <laughs> but I haven't even started. That's how they feel, too. <laughs> That's exactly right. Thank you very much for listening to this episode of Shoe the Dough. Thanks to Jeremy Scott for... Being our movie guy, helping us out with that. Thanks to 88.3 The Wind for letting us use the studio and Chris Tilly from Hazo Records for the music that you hear at the beginning and the end. We appreciate that as well. Also, Campbell 16. And thank you to Campbell 16, yeah, for letting us screen movies there. And uh, that makes these Sift Pops possible. Uh, if you don't mind and you want to check out more about us, you can go to our website, shoethedough.com. You can also email us at shoethedough at gmail. Dot com. If you have any comments or questions or things that you want to say, or maybe you thought about Andrew Garfield's hair, I'm just saying, you know, it's pretty spectacular. Are you going to make a Facebook group about his hair? I, I bet it exists. I bet I don't have to. I bet I could just go like Let's it find out. right now. There's no there's no Facebook group. I mean, you could be the starter of a major thing. I'll have to do it. 
But first, one more encouragement. If you don't mind, and you could go to iTunes and subscribe there, comment there, and rate there. Those three things at iTunes, if you could check those off the checklist, that would help us out immensely. I doubly challenge, and I add on that you should probably try to share it with somebody. Because if you like it, somebody that you know might like it. So share, shoe the dough. And we're having a lot of fun. We hope you are, too. Thank you for listening. Now you can play the thank you music. Is that the music they play no. at the Oscars when somebody no. needs to wrap up? Mm-hmm. I just don't remember it being that joyful. No, exuberant. it should be. It's more like... Wah, wah, Can you imagine? Wah, 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 wah. <laughs> when they hit the time to time to finish up mark, instead of coming in slowly with strings or something, that it's like a techno beat. And just blast it over the speakers so even if they even if they try to say something you couldn't hear them. Yeah, if we ran the Oscars it would be awesome. I've actually st- started thinking about taking a notepad in- into theaters because I will come wow. out and I- I'll hit my laptop pretty quickly and jot some stuff down for my review. But in the moment, I know there's stuff I forget while I'm watching a movie. But Well, you cross a pretty big line there, too, uh, from casual to quite serious film critic. When uh, you're yeah, carrying an I've, I've probably already crossed that line. It's hard. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I think when you, when you see so many movies, you can't stop you know, looking at them critically in that kind of way. Well, and, and your purpose changes. When I go to a movie, most of the movies I go see, my purpose is not to enjoy myself. My pur- mm. my purpose is to let others know what they might think about it. Right. So you know when I w- when I went and saw Magic Mike, it wasn't because I wanted to be there. You know I had a different purpose. So it changes the way you see something. I yeah. bet that movie changed the way you see some things. <laughs> I just haven't been the same since then. <laughs>